This show is brought to you by HostBaby.com, web hosting for musicians. So you got this great song, right? And uh, maybe it's on an album, you're maybe generating some income from downloads. That's it, you move on to the next song, right? Well, not so fast. On here, on episode 56 of Music Marketing Monday, we're going to discuss how you can turn one song into several, into many income streams. I know I got your attention now. Let's rock this, baby. Information. Inspiration. Motivation for the modern musicpreneur. Time to start your week right. Here it comes. Music Marketing Monday with your host, Bob Baker. Mr. Buzz Factor. And Billy Grizak. The music marketing mind. Ready? Ready? Are you sure? Set. Here it comes. Swing, baby. Today is today is double lucky day do you know what i mean by double lucky day well the number seven is lucky and if you take two sevens you're double lucky and if you take two sevens put them together you get the number 14 and that's what we're talking about today is 14 different ways you can make money from one song is that incredible hey who am i well you know me i am the full-time working musician squeezing out a couple of minutes between gigs here to help uh, do this podcast of that guy over there putting on his reading glasses it's Bob Baker, Mr. Buzz Factor. I was wondering where you were going with that number thing. It sounded like we were in a casino all of a sudden. Uh, but it is true. Yeah, 14 different ways, uh, potential ways of make money from one song. I didn't I didn't even know that was possible. Did you? Well, I, I think there's even more. I bet you by the time we get done with this and, you know, we start uh, brainstorming, we'll have some extras. Then when all of our listeners, uh, by the way, thank you for being a listener. We really do appreciate that. Uh, you know, they chime in and send us some uh, feedback. We're going to have 172,495 and one half ways to make money from one song. That'll be a long book. <laughs> So that's right, man. So this came about because uh, you know, my we're both very active on Twitter, uh, and I um, regularly, you know, I post like every I don't know hour and a half or whatever throughout the uh, throughout the day. And how I, how do you find the time, Bob? Actually, I do it all through Hootsuite. So I do it all at one time, and then I move on <laughs> throughout the rest of my day. Uh, so I spend about yeah fifteen minutes or so loading up my tweets for the entire day, and then, um, but I so I link to you know I certainly link to my own content. I link when we have new episodes, and I have to go through the archives and link to older episodes of uh, of this. I I post quotes you know and different observations, but I also which is just a very smart thing to do. I curate content, and I and I point to helpful articles and blog posts and so on, videos that I find by other people. It's not all about me. It's about sharing what's important to my to my audience. Now, see, and that, so that's what's different about you and me. <laughs> you only are self serving. Yeah, yeah. In my world, it's all about me. You know. So anyway, <laughs> hey, you know who else? You know who else does exactly what you're doing? Who is that? Our good friend Dave Cool. He does do that. Yes. In fact, this very <laughs> that's what, what a genius segue. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, well, I, I actually sent you a couple of links to some blog posts, and the one that we decided to focus on was on the Band Zoogle website. And Dave Cool, our our friend, uh, has been with uh, Band Zoogle, I think, for at least a couple of years. He's been one of the. I'm sure he probably wears many hats there, but I know he's like content manager in charge of their blog. And so he posted this, uh, and but it's an excerpt. Where apparently, it's it's from a guy named Bobby Borg. Um, and I actually have met both Dave Cool and Bobby Borg at the Taxi Road Rally, which is an annual thing that happens in L.A. Uh, every uh, every uh, fall. Uh, and so it's very cool that I have a connection. Have you ever met either one of them by any chance? Not in person. Not in person. And I know that this uh, blog post originally appeared on the Sonic Bids blog. Bam. Oh, excuse me. Did I drop another name? <laughs> I think you did. See how this is all interrelated. So Sonic Bids posted this from Bobby Borg, and then Banzoogle picked it up, and then I shared it, and here we are talking about and it. You like, and you met them both at the Taxi Road Rally. See, oops, I dropped another name, darn it. Let me pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> we really need some sponsors or something. <laughs> if, if, all right. if all these people paid a quarter each. you know. Yeah, so know. if you guys are listening, man, all right? So anyway, but hey, no, seriously, it's, it's our duty. It's our job. It's our passion to help you guys out and uh, – one of the things that everybody's always asking us is, like, can you actually make money with your music? Well, uh, 
definitely. I do it every single day, every minute of every day, and this is one of the ways uh, that you can do it. So you want to dig in, Bob? Yeah, and, and what this reminds me of is, is uh, like, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a musician also as not quite the full-time level that you are at, but we've established that we're both players. Uh, but I also obviously make a living from information products. And this actually, looking over this list, I see a great parallel to my publishing world because from one piece of content, say a book, I can create a paperback book. I can create an ebook. I can take it and read it and record it and turn it into an audio book. I can then take the material from the book and turn it into a live workshop. I can turn it into an online course. Uh, I could turn it into a four-week virtual program, like the one that 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 you're involved in now, um, called the Passion Project thing. Um, and so, but yeah, I, I never thought of the many ways that you can do that with a song. So I'm really excited about this. So do you want to? Uh, maybe we can go back and forth reading some of them. How do you want to handle this? Well, sure. And uh, so, Mr. Borg, resistance is futile. I'm sure he never hears that. Uh, his uh, 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 blog post starts out with, here's how to turn a single song into 14 different money-making revenue streams. Number one, uh, you can remix it and take the lyrics away. Now it's an instrumental version that can be licensed on film and TV. That is very smart. And you can even take that a step further. In my world, um, uh, one of my worlds, because I have several, uh, but in my world of doing uh, children's music, um, a lot of... um, uh, our music is sold to uh, music teachers at schools, and mm. I'm always being asked constantly for two things. Uh, like when they find a song of mine they like, they always come back to me and they say, uh, do you have lyrics and a lead sheet, which we'll get into later. But they always ask me, do you have a track, uh, like a karaoke track of the song so the kids can sing it at our, our concert? Uh, you know, we teach it to them. Mm. So, um, you know, a lot of people in my realm, uh, are doing that, but you know, with the popularity of things like karaoke and or even just folks that even go out and do gigs, I've seen I see a lot of people these days doing what I call professional karaoke gigs. I went to a lounge the other day, and let's face it, you know, you're um you're a guitar player, you can go out and do a single. You're a keyboard player, you go out and do a single. Well, some singers have actually taken to taking tracks out and getting gigs. Believe it or not, just with their little backing tracks and singing. So if they if there's a song of yours they really like, why not sell them the backing track? You know, and I was gonna say because that's not even on this list. The karaoke track is see? it? See, see, Yo, there we go. you're right. So we're we're heading toward four hundred and eighty seven thousand or whatever I'm you talk you, man, about. Yeah, yeah. But 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 this thing, uh, and even though, I don't think we've ever covered licensing in depth on the show. Um, but and I and it's still an area that I have a lot to learn. But one thing. I I have heard from my friends and people that I know who have who have had some success with licensing is that these companies actually like well they like to deal with not with independent artists because they probably get, can license the tracks cheaper than going with a major you know a popular song through a major label but they also like to deal with artists directly who actually own the masters and who can man- easily manipulate the tracks and do it quickly so somebody says oh I love this song but we need this section with the either the guitar solo removed or the vocals you know re- rearranged in so many seconds um, you know if you could hop on your your computer and whip that out for them quickly that will put you in a pretty good position to be uh to to to, to be a popular <laughs> uh, item with with licensing music and so i think that's a great a great way to repurpose your songs absolutely number two if you re-record it live you can release that version as a live single that's right the live version this is probably one that uh, a lot of artists don't think about because they, they they spend all the time you know perfecting the studio version of the song, um, but yeah, you can get more life out of it by recording the live version. Of course, there's some logistics involved in getting you know it's it's kind of tough to get a live mix because uh, you need usually need multiple microphones and and somebody who knows what they're doing there. Now, uh, one, now one thing you can do is we play this one uh, venue, and I'm sure if there's one in the middle of nowhere, like we're talking, well, not the Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's the middle of nowhere, but it's not like you know New. New York or Tennessee or wherever you're on tour, but at this particular venue, it's really nice. Uh, you go in, they have house sound, and one thing they have is they have a board that when the band plays, they can actually, while the band is playing, they can hit a record button, and it will take every track that has a live microphone. So let's say we've mic'd up, we've used 12 microphones, mm-hmm. it'll it'll create, check this out, Bob, 12 separate tracks <laughs> of the band playing live and bounce it down to... Um, 
uh, uh, an external hard drive for you uh, oh, wow. that, that you could take into a studio and remix into a live album. In fact, this particular uh, venue I play at, they actually uh, lease out their uh, uh, venue during the day to bands that want to record uh, a, a quote unquote live album or re- record quickly and they can go into the afternoon for you know a few hundred bucks and rip through some songs and he'll give them the all the stems of the songs they recorded that day which oh, is that, an interesting option to going into a studio that is that is cool i did not i did not know about that uh, another one that's not you know really uh, um, earth shattering but it's to, and I, I like this idea is take especially if you got a full band version you know studio version of your songs re-record it acoustically or unplugged and that you know you could even do it stylistically different slow it down or you know, uh, sing different melodies, you know, I mean, or it, it, so there's also stuff that you can do acoustically by stripping it down. I think that's a beautiful thing. Right. And another thing you do to get even more income is if, if you have like a set's worth of uh, your tunes that you could turn into unplugged versions and record them, you can use that as a promotional um, uh item to actually book yourself for some unplugged shows uh the for instance uh some acts touring right now are looking for acoustic support they might not want a full band with drums and uh we saw uh the lead singer from live uh came to green bay and he did an acoustic unplugged show and there was a band local band in town came out and they just basically played with acoustic guitars and shakers uh to open up for him because he didn't want a band with drums and electric guitars so mm-hmm. having that in your hip pocket is great and then you can also sell it so there you go you're making triple income off the uh off the one song all right we're yeah the, the list is extending here's one that uh i'm very familiar with again in the information publishing in addition to all those formats i talked about that my books can be in yeah you can also and i haven't done this yet but i need to uh is uh, you can ha- i can have a book translated into another language like spanish or german or whatever and then once that's translated, you could can also do the paperback version, the ebook version, the audiobook version. Uh, but yeah, but sing it in another language. It's now a translation suitable for new markets. And what a friend of mine who's actually been a consulting client, a uh, gal named uh, Sylvia Bennett, she sings uh, songs from the, uh, the great American songbook, like so, like classic songs from you know years gone gone by so she has her english versions but she has put out albums in both spanish and french with some of these classic american songs and uh and yeah i think it's i I think that's a brilliant idea if you can if you can swing that bands have kind of gotten away from that back in the uh 50s and well in the 60s for sure a lot of bands that you can hear like italian versions of like uh space oddity by david bowie and german versions of i want to hold your hand by the beatles and stuff Mm -hmm. and uh, i don't know why bands don't do that more often especially now that uh even in the states we're becoming more like bi and trilingual it would it would seem to make a lot of sense if especially if you have someone in the group that could uh sing in those languages or another income stream from the song would be to find a multilingual band and have them record it and you release it basically you know uh with your label you know that's a possibility as well so it's like another band doing a cover version of it in their language yeah which sort of which is it listed here see what i'm telling you there's oh man oh man i tell you so yeah that's very that's and it it may be that uh, that english is so prominent in most countries around the world now that maybe because i know like in japan a lot of uh you know whether it's blues or whatever or pop um I, i think they just have gotten used to singing it in in uh, english or and figured you know and so but i still think there's an opportunity there that, that, that. A- absolutely absolutely so there you go uh, moving on now here's what it's interesting if you remix it with a guest dj it cannot be an electronic dance version and the uh interesting thing there is something we've talked about in the past is piggybacking and and networking with other musicians in different genres yeah, and I, uh, just in recent years, have experienced, my because my girlfriend Pookie and I did put out an electronic sort of dance album uh, under the Soul Massage uh, Project label, um, and, uh, I, and even though I haven't done this myself, I understand that it's very common, like, to use uh, SoundCloud or some of these there's collaborative sites where you make your tracks available um, to DJs or people that remix it, and so, yeah, through collaboration, you could probably come up with many different versions of it um and yeah whether it's a dance version or somebody just takes it and remixes it into a different feel you know so that's a great idea too so collaboration Mm -hmm. and here's something i've I've been a part of uh if you compile it with six or ten other songs that become part of an album or compilation 
Um, we've done a couple of these where uh, we've gotten together like a dozen or so other artists, and we all uh, threw a track on an album, and we chipped in and uh, got a bunch of CDs. Pre-